All right, so we're going to look at John 17 the next three weeks, Lord willing. Take a break from Chronicles. We'll jump into First Chronicles in the month of June. Our Second Chronicles in the month of June, and look at First Kings with with Second Chronicles. Uh, John 17 uh, is the. You'll have a couple different titles. One is uh, I think it's uh, most Bibles have the High Priestly Prayer of Christ, and so we're going to look at uh, the first ten verses tonight, and maybe nine verses next week, and then our last week uh, about seven verses. So. <clears throat> What you'll see in the first uh, several verses is the word glory and glorify. And so we'll look at that um, as praying that God would be glorified um, in me and in others. Uh, we have Christ as our example, and there are a few aspects of this prayer that there is no way we can pray. We'll point those out tonight in the first five verses. Uh, but the, the rest of the prayer, we can pray and should model this, uh, our interceding for other people. What's fascinating about this prayer, and I, I did watch Craig's um, Sunday school, so this isn't going to be a repeat of that. And uh, with trying to cover five or six chapters, you didn't have very much time for John 17. So, And um, looking at John 17 is so rich. It's as rich or richer than the book of Romans is going to be for us. And I think uh, we'll have to slow down and point out, uh, we'll get really good theology uh, from, from the Gospel of John here. So Jesus, when he had spoken, so the context here, when Jesus had spoken these words, uh, John 13 to 16, washing the disciples' feet and then all the teaching on the Holy Spirit, uh, when he had spoken these words, and this is the last thing he says in the upper room, because look at John 18, 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is the last recorded thing that we have that Jesus does in the upper room, the night of his arrest, uh, betrayal and arrest, and the, the day before he is crucified. So he lifts up his eyes to heaven and says in 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom uh, you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So the first five verses focusing on giving uh, God glory. The first uh, thing that Jesus says here, Father, the hour has come. So what do we know about the hour that Jesus has mentioned several times in his earthly ministry? Uh, a couple times he says, my hour has not yet come. They tried to throw him off the hill in uh, Nazareth, and he couldn't do it because his hour wasn't come. Whenever his mother asked to turn the water into wine or to help the servants, uh, he's like, my hour hasn't come. Uh, several other times, uh, they picked up stones to stone him, and they couldn't stone Jesus. They couldn't kill him because his hour hadn't yet come. So when you read all of that and you get to John 17, 1, you're like, okay, what is the hour that he's talking about? It's a very precise event. What comes to your mind when you think of the hour? There's the rest of the crucifixion. The crucifixion, yeah. So the hour is, and in this context, he, he gives us a little bit of idea what the hour is. So the hour has something to do with the son glorifying the father and the father glorifying the son. So what is what does to glorify mean? It is to, well, some of you have glasses and now I have them. <laughs> uh, it helps me. See, uh, it helps glorify the words on my page. It helps it magnify. Also, the idea magnify and to please. So if you were to teach a four to six-year-old junior church, like I had the privilege of the last month, uh, to help four to six-year-olds understand, the purpose of life is to glorify God. Every church 
their goal is to glorify God. Every Christian, our goal in life is to glorify God. Uh, we have seen this in Chronicles with David passing on to Solomon and summarizing all of what Solomon is to do is to glorify God with his life and magnify the glory of God with the temple that he is about ready to build. So if you ask why we exist as a church, we exist to glorify God by knowing Christ, making him known. So how do we glorify God? Uh, pleasing him. Uh, the, uh, Jesus says in John 10, I've always did what pleased the Father. I think we looked at that or mentioned that last time uh, with pleasing God. So uh, he says the hours come and he's asking for first that the Father would glorify your son. So magnify the son is what the son is asking the father to do. But for a purpose that the son may glorify you so on the cross his hour has come on the cross the son is going to be magnified he's going to be lifted up this doesn't happen in private this doesn't happen in um at night when um with the arrests and other, a, lot, a lot of the other events the hour that jesus is glorified is when he is on the cross he told us about that he told nicodemus of that that as the serpent was lifted up in the in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that he would, so that people could trust him. But here it says, "Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you." So, what about the Father? Does the Son magnify when He's on the cross? John three sixteen. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The love of God is magnified on the cross. All of the attributes of God are magnified on the cross, but the world cannot say that God doesn't love me because he gave his only son. Where did he give his only son? On the cross, he was glorifying the father's love. A father that loved the world so much that he would not withhold his only son, which we saw um at uh, Easter a month ago, uh, an Abraham story uh, that Abraham rejoiced to see uh, Jesus day. So Jesus is praying that he, that the father would glorify the son during his hour on the cross for the purpose that the son would glorify him. The world knows what God the father is like because of the son's hour. And Jesus is praying this right before he goes to the cross verse two since you have given him uh, all authority over all flesh christ has authority over all flesh we know at the great commission jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth christ has authority over all flesh christ has exercised a lot of that authority some of it in private some of it in public but all those signs that are mentioned in the gospel of john are demonstrating authority that Christ has. And where does Christ get his authority from? From the Father. And he says, okay, you since you've given him authority, the Son, the authority over all flesh, why does he give him this authority? So that the Son can do what in verse 2? Give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So this is the beauty of election. God chooses people. God gives people to the Son. And everyone that the Father chooses and gives to the Son, the Son has authority to give them what? Eternal. Eternal life. This is all God language. As much as I want to give people eternal life and you want to give people eternal life, you can't do it. <laughs> because we're not an eternal God. We can't give that kind of gift. But the Son can give eternal life, which proves he is God. All right, so the theology here is so rich in hearing God talk to God here. Uh, that's verse two. Verse three, and this is eternal life. If we were to boil down eternal life and someone says to you, what's the big deal about eternal life? How would you describe eternal life? John 17, three is the verse you go to. Okay, so let's look at John 17, three. It says, 
And this is eternal life, what the Son can give to everyone who the Father gives to him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus has already said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. But when you try to get to God and you go through Christ, you find you get the true God. And it is a knowledge here. It is a relationship here. And so when does eternal life begin? At the moment of our death? No, before that, at the moment of our salvation. Why? Because that's when we get to know God personally as Father through the Savior. And so Christ is saying, okay, this is life eternal. You want to know what eternal life is? Eternal life that was promised earlier in the book and the eternal life that I can give to, to anyone because I have all this authority. This is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God. There is only one God, the true God. And every other man-made God is not the true God. And to not to know any of those other gods, you're not going to have eternal life. But when you know the true God and know Jesus Christ was sent by that true God as your Savior, now you have eternal life. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth. Here is the Son telling the Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Wait a minute. This is before the cross that Jesus is praying this. Jesus, and he's talking about his hour, which is going to the cross and paying for our sin. How is it that Jesus is talking about a future event, which would have been the next day, as it's in the past? For those of you that love English, this is called the prophetic perfect tense. Only God can talk this way. He talks about the future as in past tense. And like, like we can't say I did this talking about something that is going to happen tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow has. We can't control everything in our in our sovereignty and providence to make sure all that happens. But God can. And the son tells the father in a prayer before his hour has come, before his event on the cross, he tells the father, I have i have glorified this past tense i glorified you on earth i magnified who you were on earth and he's talking about the next day and it says adding to that i have accomplished again another past tense the work that you gave me to do and jesus knows and the gospels are very clear the work that the son came to do was to pay for the sins of the world and he set his face to go to Jerusalem and no one was talking him out of it. No, no disciple was saying, hey, you can't, you shouldn't go to the cross. And he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, when Peter tries to talk him out of going to the cross. So Jesus talks about the future, glorifying God and accomplishing the work that the father gave him to do in past tense. But he's talking about the next day, the future. Only God can talk about the future this way. Jesus is God. He can talk the, about the future this way. Verse 5. And here's another verse that we can't pray this way, but God can pray this way. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. <laughs> All right. Now, do not pray this to God. God, glorify me with the glory I had. Before. Now, there are cults that think that we existed before these bodies and that our souls existed up there and God at the perfect time, well, whenever we were born, sent our soul to earth and joined with our body. That's heresy. That's not, we didn't exist eternally in the past. Only God existed in eternity past. And it tells us here how long Jesus has existed. Well, he existed before the world existed. And we know from John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So Jesus is, is praying for that the father would glorify um, him with the glory that he had all always before he came to earth and he's going to have it when he goes back to heaven and he has it now and he's going to have it forever. Uh, Jesus is never going to give up his glory as he did when he came to earth again, he's going to have that glory 
and he prays about it here. Now, we want to pray this at times. Father, glorify me. Okay? We want some glory. <laughs> we think we at times deserve glory, or we, we deserve respect, we deserve <laughs> praise, we deserve recognition, we deserve exaltation, all these things that we want that aren't ours, because there is one place uh, in the universe of glory, and it's not up for <laughs> debate or vote. And when Satan thought he could be like the Most High, oh no, he was cast out of heaven. And none of us can be uh, can be God. Uh, so uh, only God can pray this way. So verses 4 and 5 are only God uh, praying this way. Verses 6 to 10, Jesus starts praying for his disciples. And he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. And you gave them to me. And talking about likely their salvation here is they have kept your word or obeyed your word. So Jesus is the living word. Jesus as the living word comes with the word of God. And those who obey Jesus' words have the eternal life that he promised. And uh, those are the people that God gave him out of the world. And it's pretty clear as you read through the Gospels who is in and who is not. Who's obeying the word, who's obeying Jesus, and who is not. Who wants to pick up stones and kill Jesus? Oh, well, they're not following Jesus. <laughs> and they're not getting to the Father. Um, so Jesus starts praying from verses 6 to 19. He's praying for his disciples. And we can learn uh, how to intercede for others. Uh, we don't know who, who belongs to God um, completely, all those in the church. Uh, who have trusted Christ alone, they do belong to God. Um, we know that they are gods and because God gave them to Christ and that they have obeyed God's word. And now verse 7, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. They know th certain things here, and the first thing they know is that everything that I have given them is, is from you. What he's saying, I think, is, is the unity here uh, of the Father and the Son. The Son doesn't do anything on his own accord. They understand the connection. They understand what John 14 says when Philip says, hey, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I think, based on that, that the disciples' light bulbs went off. Oh! And they didn't ask Jesus to see the Father anymore because they were seeing the Father by seeing Jesus. Um, and so why are they seeing him? Because God the Father has given them to Jesus. Jesus has given them eternal life, and eternal life is knowing the only true God and knowing Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And they're understanding the connection now that everything that the Father has given the Son is from the Father. Verse 8, for I have given them. So what is it specifically that, um, that, he, that Jesus has given his followers? I've given them the words that you gave me. So I don't know if there was a father, son. Um, the son agrees to go to earth, and the father says, I want you to say these words to uh, to the to uh, the, the, the your followers, uh, to those who I'm going to give to you, and all that we need to know is recorded. If you have a red letter Bible, I love red letter Bibles because we can see the words of Christ um, there, and everything that we have uh, in writing is what the Father wants us to learn about what the Son said. And you remember what is the end of the Great Commission, teaching them to observe or obey everything that I commanded. So all the words of Jesus, because he has all authority, um, his followers are to obey and to be taught and to know everything that the son commanded his followers. And we are to continue that great commission now. So Jesus says in verse eight, I've given them the words that you gave me and they have received them. That's another way of saying kept them or obeyed them. They've received them. They haven't rejected them. And have come to know, they've come to understand in truth that I came from you. Uh, you sent me, and they have believed that you sent me. 
This is extremely important. Jesus doesn't come as just a teacher, just a prophet, just whatever. He is God's son who the father sent. And there are religions in this world that reject that truth and cannot imagine that God is, is a father and, sent, and could have a son. But good theology says he did. And the father sends the son. The son speaks and his followers obey and listen. Verse nine, I'm praying for them. So here's the intercession. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. So Jesus focuses his thoughts uh, and his attention, not on everyone in the world now. He's praying just for uh, those whom, let's keep reading, uh, not, not for those in the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So the rest of this prayer are for those who are Christ, those who are God's. Uh, we sing songs like, I am his and he is mine. He will hold me fast. Um, songs of our security in in Christ and in, in the Father. Verse 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Whoa. Whoa. The end of that verse, I am glorified in them, could be its own lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson. So we've, we've what we've seen so far is the son is glorifying the father, the father's glorifying the son, and the son revealing to his followers what the father wanted his followers to know. And now Jesus says in verse 10 that I am glorified in them. What does that mean? Well, glorifying is, is magnifying, exalting, pleasing. We must magnify God's interceding for us by imitating Jesus. Jesus' rescue of our lives, of these bodies, is so that these bodies can be used to glorify Jesus to magnify Jesus. This matches what David said, that we are to, telling Solomon, you're to, to please God from a uh, willing, uh, from a, um, a willing mind is the second thing, from a whole heart and a willing mind, from the inside out. And that's what it says here. Jesus says, I'm glorified in them. So how is Jesus glorified in us? Let's hold our hand here and go back to John 13. John 13, 34, and 35. And as you have read through the Gospels uh, with us as a church, uh, there will be verses that um, are key verses that help uh, hold a lot of truth together and summarize a lot of truth in just a few verses. And John 13, 34, and 35 are some of those verses. So verse 34, um, after Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Uh, let's look at verse 31, because we see this glorified language. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now when uh, Judas Iscariot has gone out, now he's just talking to the 11. Now, this, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, then God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. And you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment, though, I give you. And so these are the words that the Father gave the Son, the Son to give to his followers. And this is this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. So we said already that as Christ's hour has come and he's glorifying the Father on the cross, he's glorifying the love of God on the cross. Now, that love that the disciples and the rest of us in the world are like, <laughs> God is a loving God to go to this length to rescue vile sinners. That love, Jesus says, is the love that I want you, my followers, to love one another. And then he says in verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. All people will know that we follow Christ if we have Christ-like 
love in us for one another. All right, so let's go now to 1 Corinthians 13, and we'll end here. 1 Corinthians 13, we have seen tonight a definition of eternal life. We have uh, seen this new commandment and that the Son is going to be glorified in his followers. And here is what the glory of Christ looks like in us, flowing out of us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc. And if you compare the fruit of the Spirit with 1 Corinthians 13, what love is, they're very similar. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 13, the world says love is love. And we say, uh, no, you can't define love how you want to define it because it's clearly defined in scripture. And uh, we can tell people that we love them. But if the love doesn't look like this, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's not real love. It's not Christ produced love. And first Corinth or, uh, John 15 says, Jesus said, abide in me. And when you abide in me, you'll, your life will bear fruit. That was two chapters before Jesus is praying for us that we would be, that he would be glorified in us. So when the Holy Spirit controls us, the spirit of Christ, what comes out of our life looks like this. When we don't allow the spirit to control us and what comes out of our life is flesh, it's not going to look like this. When we wake up every morning, we don't look like this. <laughs> we only look like this as we submit to the spirit. So the father gives the son words. Son gives the gives his followers and us through John 17 words and direction. And then he sends his spirit to help us to obey those words. And the words of when all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another, the Holy Spirit inside of us is producing this kind of love. And only Christians can show this kind of love because only the Holy Spirit can display this kind of love. So what's this love look like? Well, love is, we know it, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy and it doesn't boast. It doesn't want what other people have. What you have, you're not bragging about it. Love is not arrogant or rude. It's not proud, it's not puffed up. I don't deserve anything. It does not insist on its own way. It is not uh, irritable, easily angry. It's not resentful. It doesn't hold a grudge. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing when other people are sinning. It's not glad. Uh, it rejoices with the truth. When other people do what's right, that's when love rejoices. Love puts up with all things. Love believes. This is the hardest one. Love believes all things, believes the best about all people. Love hopes all things. Nothing is hopeless. And then love endures all things. Nothing can stop it. And love never ends. We don't wake up this way because in our flesh, we aren't naturally patient. This is an emotion or something that you can fall into. You fall into love. Well, can you fall into patience or kindness? Uh, never, you don't talk that way. <laughs> we don't think that way. Uh, these are all choices. Choices that when we rely on our flesh, this doesn't come out. When we, in Galatians 5, rely on the Spirit, and we trust in the Spirit to control us, to take God's, Christ's words that he gave us, and to glorify Christ through us, this is what comes out. So the Father orchestrates is the architect of our salvation, giving us to the, the Son. The Son gives us eternal life, helping us to know the Father and know him, and helps us to understand what it is that he is doing inside of us. He's glorifying himself. And the Spirit carries out what Christ prayed for as we rely on the Spirit, and he produces this kind of life. This is fruit. This is things that people can see. Can can people see if we're patient and kind? Well, yeah. Can they see if we're impatient and unkind? Yeah. <laughs> so these the fruit is something that's visible. This love is visible. And by this kind of love, 
for other believers is how all the world knows that we are Christ's disciples and Christ is glorified in us as John 10 encourages. So how does this influence our praying? Well, we pray for other believers that God will be glorified in them. How do we pray for the lost? That they would know the true God and Jesus Christ whom they had sent. That they would understand the connection of Jesus coming and the Father sends him and and that we can't control who, G who God the Father chooses, but everyone the Father sends to the Son, the Son gives them eternal life. And so we're praying that the world could see uh, the Son. We magnify the Son who's magnifying the Father. So we just have to obey the Spirit. You know, we obey the Spirit. This can come out. And so the world can't say, I can't see God in your life. They couldn't say that about Christ. They could see God at the cross. They could see God as he, all throughout the life of Christ. And as we're obedient and submissive to the Spirit, the world can see God as, we're, as he is, Christ is glorified in us.